Computers generate 3D images by projecting shapes onto a plane, converting them into pixels, and adjusting their textures and shades. Let's learn how this works and why GPUs are so good at this. We'll start with vertices. Our goal is to take this 3D point cloud and project it into a 2D surface. One way to do this is to imitate the way pinhole cameras work in real life. Light enters through the aperture of the camera and gets projected into a sensor that interprets the signal as an image. Let's place our simulated camera at the origin of the coordinate system, at the intersection of three axes, X, Y, and Z. The camera is looking in the Z direction, where the point cloud is located. To obtain the projected 2D image, we calculate how light would reach the sensor for each vertex. Light travels in straight lines, so if we look sideways along the ZY plane, we see that the trajectory of a light ray traces similar triangles, which lets us calculate the position of the projected point along the y-axis. We do the same thing looking the other way to find the position along the x-axis. Doing this for all points, we obtain a projection of the point cloud. The image is inverted because that's how optics work. Our brains or cameras just flip the image afterwards. But we don't have to do this for 3D graphics. We can modify the equation to obtain the vertices on an image plane instead of a simulated sensor, and we get an upright image right away. The equation we got is very simple because I lined up the camera with the coordinate system. If, say, we rotate the camera and translate it to a different position, the equation we had before falls apart because it no longer describes how light reaches the camera. But here's a trick. We could bring the camera back to its original position and apply that same inverse transformation to the object. This does not change where the object is located relative to the camera, but it recenters the camera back at the origin of the coordinate system. This would bring us back to the situation we had before, and we could reuse the same equation to project vertices. And for that, we'll use homogeneous coordinates. So far, we've represented vertices in Cartesian coordinates, which use three elements, one for each axis. Homogeneous coordinates use four elements. The first three are the same, and the last one is set to one for vertices. Granted, this doesn't seem useful, but homogeneous coordinates actually simplify transformations. For instance, we can represent translations and rotations with matrix multiplications. This is a translation matrix. It's a 4x4 four four array that we can multiply with homogeneous coordinates to obtain a translated position. We can also use a rotation matrix to change the orientation of an object. Even better, we can chain matrices and multiply them to obtain a new matrix that describes a full transformation. Another cool property of transformation matrices is that we can easily compute their inverse which gives the opposite transformation. That way we can undo transformations and bring objects back to their previous configuration. We'll use matrix multiplications to project vertices. First, a model matrix configures the position and orientation of the object. Then, a view matrix transposes the object into the coordinate system of the camera. The view matrix is the inverse of the matrix that describes the configuration of the camera. Now, we are back at our initial situation and can reuse the previous equation to project the vertices. But this equation is just one special case of projection. There are multiple ways to project images. Perspective projections imitate how eyes perceive objects, so the ones far from the camera appear smaller than the ones close to it. The field of view is a parameter that controls how wide the camera sees. When it's around 60 degrees, the projection looks natural because it roughly matches how our eyes work. A wider field gives kind of a fisheye effect, while using a narrower field looks more flat. We can play around with the field of view to create cool effects. You know, there's this shot in Jaws where the camera moves towards the actor while the field of view increases. This is called a dolly zoom. It gives the impression that the background recedes while the character approaches the camera. It doesn't look realistic, but it creates an artistic effect. Apart from the field of view, we can parameterize perspective projection with the near and far planes, that is, the boundaries of the space that will be rendered onto the screen, as well as the aspect ratio of the camera. These parameters can be plugged in a projection matrix, which we can add to our chain of matrices. To obtain the 2D projection, we need to multiply all of these matrices with the coordinates of the vertex that we want to project. Finally, we divide the first three elements of the homogeneous coordinates by the last one. This is called perspective division. Another type of projection is called parallel. It does not distort the proportion of objects while projecting them. As a result, objects far from the camera appear as big as the ones close to it. 
One type of parallel projection is called orthographic, and it's like using a perspective camera with an infinitely small field of view. The result does not look realistic, but it makes it easier to compare the size of objects, which makes it useful in architecture and engineering, where you want to measure dimensions easily. So we can obtain 2D images from 3D vertices by multiplying their coordinates with model, view, and projection matrices, and then doing the perspective division. One thing I'll point out is that these calculations are easy to parallelize because each vertex in the scene is multiplied by the same matrix. This is a form of data parallelism. We perform the same calculations on different input data, so they can run independently. GPUs were made to run data parallelism efficiently, so they can split matrix multiplications at a much higher scale than CPUs and achieve higher performance. Point clouds, like this one, are used in many applications, like that's what we obtain when scanning environments with LIDARs. But in 3D graphics, most of the time, we don't want to see gaps between vertices. Instead, we use polygons to depict solid surfaces, and you can make complex objects by combining multiple ones. For simplicity, we break the polygons up into triangles and project the vertices onto the screen with matrix multiplication and perspective division. We now need to convert these 2D coordinates into pixels. This is called rasterization. We first restrict the computations to a bounding box around the vertices because we know that pixels outside of that area are not part of the triangle. Then we define three equations, one for each side of the triangle, and apply this condition to find which pixels are inside of it. This is also easy to parallelize in GPUs because it's a form of data parallelism. We compute the same equation on different input data, in that case, on different pixels. And that's how we project triangles onto a screen. This is the basic procedure to rasterize triangles, but modern graphics pipelines implement a bunch of optimization techniques on top of that to accelerate rendering. For instance, they use a z-buffer to keep track of the apparent depth of each pixel. That way, a triangle behind another one will not be drawn over a triangle that is closer to the camera. We can also use backface calling to ignore triangles that are facing away from the camera. That's why, when a character goes out of bound, the walls seem to disappear. They are still there, but the graphics engine renders them on one side only to reduce computations. Graphics pipelines also clip triangles that are out of the camera scope to avoid rendering them. Those are just a few simple optimization techniques, there's more of them. Now, we know which area of the screen is occupied by projected triangles, and we need to find the color of each pixel. That depends on the surface. If it's a uniform color, we can just apply it to all of its pixels. You can create cool objects with flat colors, but you'll probably agree that they are a bit limited. To add detail, we can paste textures onto surfaces. And of course, we cannot just superimpose textures onto projected triangles, because then, the textures would have the wrong perspective, it's not realistic. We need to map the pixels of projected triangles to texture coordinates in a way that follows the projection. For that, we compute barycentric coordinates. They specify where each pixel of the triangle is located relative to the center of the triangle. Afterwards, we use these equations to determine UV coordinates, which indicate the corresponding location of each pixel on the texture. That way, we can map pixels of the triangle to pixels on the texture, and display it in 3D. That works well when the texture is high definition, but if the texture is too small, or if the triangle is too big, um, this happens. We get sharp boundaries that correspond to different pixels. That generally looks bad, so we interpolate colors between pixels to obtain smoother transitions. Interpolation used to be more obvious in older video games because they relied on low-res pictures but they have become less common in modern games. Barycentric coordinates and color interpolation, by the way, are also trivially parallelized in GPUs because they can be computed independently. So far, we've succeeded in replicating the look of 3D games from the early 90s. The projection looks right, the textures are displayed with the proper perspective, but it looks really simple and unrealistic. A big reason for that is the lack of shades. Light modifies how environments look, we don't notice it all the time, but when lightning is too uniform, things look a bit uncanny. Realizing this, people invented a new type of program called shaders, which originally modified the color of projected pixels. This is useful to simulate the ways in which light gets reflected. When it encounters a smooth surface like still water, it gets reflected in a mirror-like way. This is called specular reflection. When it bounces off a rough surface like unfinished wood, it gets scattered around. This is called diffuse reflection. Shaders can simulate both specular and diffuse reflection from the position of a light source 
the position of a camera, the geometry of an object, and the properties of a material to increase realism. Shaders can do many other things. A famous one is cell shading, which applies a threshold to colors to give the resulting image a cartoony appearance. Shaders can also inverse colors, simulate the glow of metals, modify lightning, and so on. And you'll have guessed it, shaders are easy to accelerate in GPUs because they can run in parallel. The original purpose of shaders was to create visual effects, but they have become more and more versatile over time. For instance, matrix multiplications used for projection were performed by fixed instructions in the graphics pipeline, but modern graphics frameworks now use vertex shaders for that, and we can customize them. Whenever you wonder why GPUs are good at something, it's almost always because of parallelization. Both devices perform the same arithmetic operations, but GPUs are made to do those simultaneously, which makes them really good for data parallelism. And the operations in the graphics pipeline, projecting vertices onto a screen, rasterizing polygons, adding textures, and applying shaders, all of those operations happen to be easy to parallelize. There are more operations in the typical graphics pipeline. I've presented the main ones, but a modern framework lets us fine-tune even more stuff. I talked about the principles behind 3D graphics, but not how to program it. We usually do that with graphics frameworks like OpenGL or Vulkan, which handle complex operations for us. I'll probably do a video to explain how to use them, and there are other applications I want to talk about, like how GPUs can accelerate neural networks or physics engines. Besides, there are some interesting geopolitical developments between the US and China regarding semiconductors. Sounds like a cool topic to cover. And if you have other ideas, you can always